welcome. Uh, you have joined the Redesigning Sustainable Value Chains post-COVID session, uh, and I'm really thrilled to have you here. Uh, my name is Andrew Crosby. I'm a fellow at the Asian Trade Center based in Singapore. I'm speaking to you from Geneva, where I am uh, normally. So this session topic departs from, uh, departs from a framing around supply chains being broken by trade disputes and, uh, and COVID-19 accelerating uh, the way that, that supply chains are, are, are structured, value chains are structured. And, it, and it, it cites big data analysis and potential for greater sustainability, productivity, innovation. And I think just picking up on the sustainability piece, you know, at one point that might have just meant efficiency and better global distribution and resilience to disruption. Um, and, and indeed, all those things are still important. But uh, in recent years, and probably especially in, in just the last year, uh, the perspective has really changed. And sustainability means what, um, what at least people in my line of work around sustainable development really means sustainable development. It's, it's what, what we can change to, uh, to, to improve the condition of people uh, and the earth. So I'm, I'm breaking up a little bit. Is that right, Amy? Can you all hear me? You break. Okay. All right. Thank you. All right. So, uh, so that's, for example, the ESG investing uh, has been a, a huge trend. Maybe some people would say a bubble. Companies have had to respond. Uh, and, uh, and so it's in this context that uh, we have a panel today. It's going to focus and we've got people who are really well versed in traditional, uh, traditional aspects of value chains. But these are all systemic thinkers. And in my conversations with each of them as we've um, approached this panel, I think all of you have, uh, have brought this concept of, you know, moving from value chains to value ecosystems, if you will. Uh, and, and I think this is really fascinating. So we're going to try and push the concept of this panel one step further if we can. Uh, so we're, we, were, we were talking about things like what are the major trends? What are the implications for business strategy and what emergent strategies might make business uh, more future fit or competitive in this context of sustainable sustainability? Um, are new muscles needed, new organizational muscles, new social muscles? Uh, do we need anything different from governments? Is the enabling environment right? Has it changed? And, and do we need to catch up in places? And then, you know, we know that consumers drive a lot of the changes that happen, but what is it that businesses could do that could help redirect or, or focus uh, where, where consumers are? So we're gonna talk about this. I've got great panelists. Uh, we're gonna have each of them intervene for a few minutes and uh, they can introduce themselves a little bit then, but then we're gonna go, we're gonna do around the table uh, and then we're going to come back and, uh, and, and stir up a little discussion and see where we go. So let me just give brief introductions and then I'll let our first, uh, first panelist lead off. So uh, Ernst Jan Kreis is founder of Solve, uh, based in Hong Kong in the Netherlands. Gary Barker, CEO and founder, chief designer of Ditto Sustainable Brand Solutions in the U.S., uh, Nikhil Hirdaramani, I, that, I, that balled up a little bit in my mouth, Nikhil Hirdaramani. Okay, you'll correct me. Uh, <laughs> director of the Hirdaramani Group, based in the UK. Uh, Gustavo Gori uh, is chairman and co-founder of Smarter Chains in Switzerland. And Amy Seidman, founder of Noble Profit in the US. Uh, so that's, that's who we are, and we're going to have fun. And I'm going to give the floor now to... Ernst Jan, um, you as audience, if you have uh, uh, if you have questions or comments, please uh, type them into the comment box, and we'll try and pick them up as we go. Um, we'll have a you know we'll have about twenty five minutes or so presentations, and then we'll stir it up a little bit. So let me pass it to you, Ernst Jan. Okay, great. Thanks a lot, to Andrew, for the introduction. Uh, just a few seconds on uh, my background. I'm doing investment banking, merge acquisitions, uh, quite a bit also in the investment, uh, in the uh, impact uh, uh, environment. 
Uh, we do that in uh, in Europe and in Asia, uh, between those countries mostly. Uh, Philippines is one of the countries where basically the impact uh, journey started. And if you talk about value chains, the first uh, transaction we did was in the coffee market, where I realized that uh, if you look at the classic value chain, there's... Uh, tremendous gap between the farmer at the beginning of the chain and uh, and the retail, uh, which is completely disbalanced. Uh, that was kind of the start of a journey in uh, impact investments. And since then, we have covered uh, a lot of other areas, also in off-tech and other fields. What, uh, what we have seen uh, through the years is... Uh, uh, that uh, basically in, in most mergers acquisitions is typically v- vertical or horizontal in the value chain. So it's always yeah, typical value chain transactions. But I think in the last maybe five, six years, you could definitely see that there's going to be a big change from value chains to ecosystem. And that means that there's a lot of more complexity uh, means that it's a lot of cross-border, uh, cross-industry uh, transactions happening, completely different structures, um, different way of governance, different way of thinking, uh, from basically from shareholders to stakeholders. Uh, so that's that there's so much things that have been changing over the last years, and I think especially, that's at least my experience in the last two years, especially where we also saw that uh, due to COVID and all the limitations that there were, uh, that uh, people started to think in a different way, that they started to think more from a collaboration perspective, much more than from a competitive perspective. Um, and that's something that I really like, that you start to be thinking from more connection, from relations, and also to think about how are the business models that are uh, related to that. Uh, so a lot of uh, also, uh, uh, let's say, cooperation between scientists from different countries uh, where completely different disciplines are now suddenly able to operate in a way that was not possible before. So uh, for me, I can say that over the last uh, few years, we have seen quite a big shift from uh, classic value chain thinking towards uh, ecosystems. Great, thank you. And uh, I think that's a, that's a great lead-in for Gary. Uh, we had a we had an excellent conversation about about ecosystems. And let, let's hand it over to you, Gary. And why don't you introduce yourself and give us a little response? Uh, thanks a lot, Andrew. Uh, I couldn't agree with Ernst more. Um, I think COVID has uh, kind of broken out the traditional uh, business model where um, Sales have changed, um, uh, uh, margins have gotten smaller. I think that businesses have to think in new uh, ways and uh, areas that there was a lot of waste before, they just can't afford to have that anymore. And it's also added to a more creative thinking as far as solutions are concerned. Um, I'm into sustainable design and my uh, position in the supply chain is to look at the entire supply chain to see where there are wastes, where there are inefficiencies in packaging, in uh, in shipping, uh, making sure that everything is is full up, the sharing of shipping lanes and resources, that sort of thing. Um, as an example of this, I, I use um, our experience in the hangar business where we looked at a system called GOH, and GOH is where um, the plastic hanger is offshored to the garment manufacturer overseas. They put the hanger on the clothing there, they ship it to the United States, to Europe, to the stores, and if you don't take home that hanger after a sale, it gets thrown in a box under the cash register, gets thrown out, and there's just uh, huge collateral damage. It's estimated that 20 billion plastic hangers are landfilled every year. So we went and looked in this sector and found out that, um, that, that we looked and see what saw what material would be better to make a hanger out of rather than making it out of plastic for a one-use product. And we uh, came up with the idea to use a paper fiberboard hanger. 
And what we found is that in shipping scenarios like GOH, we're able to fit up to 20% more product into um, packing boxes. That means 20% less uh, fewer cartons, uh, 20% less cost in yeah. shipping, in unloading and unloading as far as labor is concerned, in DC spaces, cartons showing up into stores. It just resonates down the line. And 100% of it is recyclable and made out of recycled material. So this is an example of sustainable design where you start doing deep dives into the supply chain and seeing where there are possible problems, possible inefficiencies. And instead of just jamming something in there, like the plastic hanger, which has been using, used forever, is coming up with something that's much more uh, sustainable, cost effective, and um, and has all kinds of other benefits as well, such as marketing, branding, that sort of thing. So uh, I think the long term advantage of sustainability in supply chain is that we're bringing a savings, we're bringing a more efficient systems, more shared resources, and um, and sustainable solutions uh, without without collateral waste. Good. Thank you. Another angle. How about you, Nikhil? Where, where's like, uh, yeah, where, where are you in this? Uh, where are you in this discussion? So I, I echo my fellow panelists and, and Gary mentioned an element of, of the fashion industry, um, you know, a, a supply from, from a, from a hanger perspective. Uh, but my business is actually the manufacturing of the garments, um, the clothes. Uh, and I think uh, if we look at how many items are produced a year, I think there are 104 billion items produced and and 83 percent of that ends up in landfill. Um, if, if I think if, if fashion were a country, I think it would be the world, world's fourth largest CO2 emitter. So fashion has always been an element of, 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 of issues when it comes to sustainability. So my company, I'm a, I'm a member of a fourth generation family business. Um, we have factories in, in Sri Lanka, Bangladesh, Vietnam, and in Ethiopia, uh, and we supply you know many of the uh, many of the, the brands that you know everyone would know about in in in, in, in the US and in, in the UK and Europe and in Asia. Um, you know, sustainability has been very much part of our DNA. I mean, it's it's we're family. It's been part of the way we do business. Um, but I would actually say. The sort of new evolution of sustainability, because I think you, I think you mentioned at the beginning, Andrew. I mean, in terms of what does sustainability mean, it means if you ask what people sustainability means, you might get fifty different meanings. Um, but I, I would say the new innovation of, of the, the new definition of, of people, planet, profit. Um, we, we our journey started in two thousand and five, and it was just an uncle of mine who was reading Al Gore's Inconvenient Truth, who came in one day and said, "I think we need to do something. I, you know, this is we, we're a family. We need to do something right." And, and that actually started our journey, our modern journey of sustainability, where we then uh, take, took that on board and we built um, Asia's first carbon neutral factory and green factory in Sri Lanka, producing producing clothing. Uh, and and we, we learned from there and we then uh, went on uh, to make all our factories green in some way. Um, and, and that was really the start of our journey. But when you look at what's happened, um, and I think we're here to discuss maybe what's happened in the last year. I mean, we did this in 2005. But we then sort of moved into this element of fast fashion. Um, so a real contradiction to, to sustainability in many ways. Um, but what's happened in the last year has been amazing. Uh, because if, if unfortunately, we've also been, you know, COVID has been, has had its obviously a lot of negative aspects. But if there's one silver lining, it's for sustainability. And I think we've all learned to be more sustainable. We've been able to see the clean air. And I, and I think we're also beginning, the trends are changing. Um, you know, we talked about, and you talked about the consumer. Uh, Generation X, Y, they, many surveys out there, people want to buy sustainable clothing. Uh, people want to live sustainable. And I think the, the model of the industry, um, COVID actually really showed in many ways that the model of the apparel industry maybe doesn't work um, because there are many customers that, that, that uh, you know, didn't make it, make it, didn't make it through with bricks and mortar being closed. Um, many suppliers who didn't get paid, um, you know, uh, no furloughing in, in our part of the world. So I think this is a great opportunity to now really, really relook at the model once we get through this, because COVID is not over yet. I mean, you know, in, uh, you know, at this present moment, um, you know, South Asia is 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 in really dire straits with with uh, many many cases, um, curfews. Um, it is it is not good. And then, but we 
we will get through this, we, we hope. I mean, as, as countries get vaccinated and, and we get more vaccinations, we hope we will get through this. And I think there'll be a great opportunity to really relook at what this model is going to consist of. And it, it involves the inputs and the outputs. Consumers are changing. Uh, just a couple of days ago, we would have seen that, that uh, Depop, uh, which is a rental, uh, a sort of a, a sort of, you know, rental, a, a, a sort of, they take old stock and, and they sell it, and was sold uh, for $1.2 billion to, dollars to Etsy. The consumer's changing. Uh, they want to rent clothes. They want to want to re, re, re you know give their uh, buy all clothes. Um, so that's all changing, uh, and the model has to adapt. Uh, so we really have to look at the new model. Uh, we're not there yet. I think there are many discussions, um, brands, different stakeholders, uh, as to what this new model of of the apparel industry is going to be. And and I think it's important as we are still classified as one of the most polluting industries in the world that we all sit together and collaborate to make the model a better one for the future. Fantastic. Thank you. Uh, so I, I don't know exactly what Gustavo will say, but I think these, um, these interventions so far probably play pretty well into his territory. What do you think, Gustavo? <laughs> yes, of course, it, it is right on. Uh, uh, that this is uh, uh, amazing to see. I'm very happy, actually, to see that uh, uh, the thinking is shared. The, the desire for what needs to change and the direction we are all talking about is is isn't the same you know, the same uh, corridor of action thinking and hopefully also the end point is the same i i i have a, a, a long career in the industry of operations uh, about 40 years around and i have worked in, in big supply chains like procter and gamble and uh, a little bit on uh, kimberly clark and uh, I, I have seen this uh, also through the startup of smarter chains uh, that, uh, yes, the supply chain needs to change approach. And the way we in the industry manage uh, our operations need to also be open up to a different approach to, to, le to leverage uh, really an ecosystem around us. Uh, of course, in the middle of all of this, uh, uh, we can talk about ecosystem for a, for a long while, uh, but uh, but if we frame it in the conversation of today, um, and the fact that we are uh, emphasizing so much the, the 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 sustainability aspect of the supply chains, uh, I, I think uh, we were put at test uh, uh, with COVID uh, in the industry in a, in a dramatic way, and uh, for many years, and uh, uh, in the industry we talked about. Uh, the digital revolution, you know, I perform zero. And uh, we talked about the need to change in this direction, that direction. And everybody goes like in their own way. And then it becomes a competition for who is talking bigger outside and who's making better uh, images uh, of themselves. Um, and uh, who, you know, who's trying to lead here, lead there. Quite frankly, that has to change because this is a, uh, uh, a, a more of a collective and um, overall picture uh, uh, need uh, that if we don't if we don't change as leaders the, the approach we might we might not uh, um, we will fail we will you know and COVID put a test how much talk about resilience and how much talk about uh, uh, responsiveness agility etc cetera, etc cetera. and we and we you know yes in general we succeeded uh, we make it through. But how much better could have that been? And uh, and are we really ready for the next one? And uh, what does that, what's that really mean? You know, the, what resilience really means, responsiveness, and, uh, uh, adaptability. Uh, what does that really mean? And are we doing that in the direction of what we see the trend is telling us? Because it's, the, the trends are telling us about the transparency, the need for transparency, the need for, for quality to be traceable the need for a uh, uh, process to be done the right way, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Are we, are we taking that agenda clearly? Like uh, Gary, you mentioned your client that said to you, I'm not ready for that, I will wait till my clients tell me. Uh, I mean, this is, this is a, a reactive approach that, that uh, wow, it kills us, no? It kills really the, the, the bigger picture here. So just, uh, it's, it's core to, 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 
to my sentiments and how I feel and what smart exchange does is exactly enable ecosystem uh, to put in, to be in play. Uh, I don't I don't think this is the moment to talk about it. We can talk it uh, along the along the, the half hour we are together uh, for sure. Excellent, thank you. Yeah, I think we will come back. I've got a I've got a question that I think will apply to everyone as well. But let's go to uh, to Amy. I don't. Is there much to stir up here, Amy? You told me you could help stir things up. Is there anything to stir up here? I don't know if I said that, but I certainly said that. <laughs> I'd be happy to comment on some of the things. But first of all, I'm I'm filled with heart for some of the sentiment that's happening in this room, and it's wonderful, uh, Gustavo, to hear you say and talk about resilience and the need for us to really change the one-upping game. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm loving, Nikhil, how your family has approached things and, um, you know, Gary, your hangers, and obviously um, we need to hear more from, from you, Ernst, uh, about what you're doing. Um, the things that I'm seeing, I mean, you've touched upon COVID, creating this opportunity for us in these silver linings and pointing out our our dark spots, and um, and that's definitely been happening. And I, and when this happens, there's a push pull between survival uh, and and our mentality and how we can go forth. And it's very difficult to operate from outside, you know, the survival uh, realm. And we know that from Maslow's pyramid and these different studies. Um, but we are retooling everything, and in the process of retooling everything for resilience for just actually figuring things out of where we are today, we have this tremendous opportunity. And um, as was mentioned with uh, the, the millennials, um, there is a tremendous amount of pressure that's happening. And the one thing that I'm also seeing as a pressure point are the regulations that are coming out of different countries. You know, the United States just passed uh, the Security Exchange Commission Oversight Committee on ESG Investing. We have the EU Sustainable Financial Disclosure Regulation, the Task Force for um, Climate uh, Reporting. And so there's just a ton of, of pressure points that are happening from a policy. And that is really the indicator, I think, that we've, we have won to some degree, this battle between sustainability being, you know, kind of a niche thing versus becoming mainstream because to push policy through is a tremendous endeavor. And um, and so when we see all these points coming from our customers, from regulations, from supply chain, and just the scarcity of resources, without having COVID, we were facing scarcity in different precious metals um, and the astronomical amount of uh, garbage created from hangers and apparel. I mean, it's just, it's a staggering uh, thought process. Um, and that's how the world has been, you know, working. And we worry about job loss and things like that. But I think the answer is in two, two things that I'm working on or that I see. Um, and one of which is in this need for transparency, we have this opportunity to kind of retool. Okay, there's going to be some dark stuff that we're going to see for sure. But it also points to where we can apply solutions and new innovations and as we know, um, when the internet came, none of us knew that Airbnb or Uber or banking online or shopping online, all of these were incredibly new concepts. Um, so I believe with blockchain, we're gonna see some of that happening in the world. Um, and I think with the advent of um, using these kinds of tools, at least in our work for uh, creating transparency, for creating uh, facilitating third-party verification, tracking all of this stuff. I think that there's going to be a lot of value in how people start to implement this type of stuff. The second thing is just the opportunity around circular. You can have all these factories. We can have all of this stuff. It's just a matter of repurposing uh, things. And, um, and that takes a lot of effort uh, in how we live our lives as individuals. Um, there's many countries where people aren't recycling their trash. You know, I'll, I'll go to places in the States and in my house, I have this much trash and I'll have this much recycling and I'll have this much compost, um, whereas other places don't. And I think the key to solving scarcity, to solving job creation, 
to addressing sustainability, I think circular is a really big part. Um, and through all of this, we can start looking at how we're treating people. Um, so I think it's a huge opportunity and I can't wait for us to redesign it together. So thank you. I love it. I love it. Perfect. Okay. Off we go. So I, I picked up, um, uh, amongst all that I heard, probably there's a lot more than this, but I'll, I'll, I'll pull out four points and then I'll lead off to Ernst Young and see if he would like to uh, sort of respond to any of them. Um, so industry collaboration will be needed or is happening. And, you know, who are, uh, are there unusual suspects coming together, so to speak? And what, is it, what does it look like when you actually make those? Uh, Gary Ackley mentioned something like that to me in one of our previous conversations as well. Um, how do we get smarter? Like what new tools are there um, and new approaches? Like how are we dealing with learning in the field? Uh, how, do we, how do we incorporate feedback and learning? Uh, are there entire models that will shift? Uh, Nikhil just brought up one, you know, renting clothing instead of buying it. So do we have like major um, sort of ground shifting changes that are, are coming upon us? And then uh, Amy pulled in one of my favorites uh, about regulatory, and, uh, uh, you know, in the enabling environment, you know, and, and is that ecosystem changing and how is it changing? You gave us a, a picture into that. So, so let me just, let's, let's just go freewheeling more or less. And you, Ernst Young, you can address one of those or any of those or on your own choice. It's up to you. Yeah, thank you, Andrew. Um, I absolutely recognize what you mentioned. Um, I think uh, in terms of structuring, things have changed so much over the last uh, years. Uh, in terms of uh, other ways of organizing, open ways of uh, governance, uh, different ways of cooperation, um, and much more, let's say, connecting rather than controlling. I mean... Most deals, especially when they're private equity driven, which is a large part also of the deals that we see, uh, is always very focused on control. Um, but now I think slowly, and that is something quite interesting, that you see that um, investors are also willing to have a more long-term view on investments. They are including the, the impact of what they do in the way that how they structure their deal. They are willing to consider models where uh, they don't necessarily have ownership and are driven by the short-term agenda to exit their investment in the short term to make as much money as they can. But they really try to include uh, other investments. Just to give an example, we are now, for example, doing a technology that is based on emission control for refineries. Basically, the investors are just investing there because they see the value that you can uh, that you can reduce uh, CO2 and, and uh, greenhouse gases so much and that they basically are willing to link the investment to something like that. Or in the fish industry where we have done deals in organic salmon, the, the, as you maybe know, the aquaculture industry is, uh, is a, a very fast-growing industry, but it's also very industrial, which is not necessarily good for uh, all of the fish. But when you see there how much uh, all kind of parties are starting to, co to cooperate, for example, feed suppliers and data science companies and uh, veterinarians and, um, and nutritions, and even from the market side, it's quite amazing how, how completely changing this industry is and more focused on, uh, let's say, kind of joint purpose to make things better. And that is something that... Uh, in my view, has a lot of impact on uh, structures. And I, I think, uh, uh, think the, 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 those things are really ramping up very fast. If you look to the level of investments in impact investments with these elements in it, compared to a few years ago, it has multiplied with uh, massive numbers. Great. Uh, and I'm, I'm wondering if anyone else wants to pick up off of that, uh, maybe Gary or, you know, this, you're also uh, at least raising implicitly in my mind, you know, is there, are there, are there, these are things that industry is doing on its own 
would it make a difference or accelerate it if there was more government action or, or more other action? Well, Gary, you want to pick that up? Yeah. Um, uh, yes. I mean, there would be a lot more uh, focus on it. We're seeing that in Europe because of the single use plastic bans. And even though hangers aren't uh, for some reason, uh, uh, indicated as a single use plastic, we're just getting a tremendous number of uh, companies coming to us wanting to replace their plastic hangers. However, uh, we're seeing a lot of movement in the United States too, and that's not because of regulation. That's simply because of a smart business. It's being proactive. And the company that says, yeah, we need to do it, but we'll do it when our customer tells us, that's, that's a dang model. That was also a very old company that was saying that. Mm -hmm. um, it's something that in order to do business, you've got to be far more proactive. Um, so I think, yeah, regulation is going to help in a big way, but I think business is moving in that direction anyway. And um, I, I think it's also a way, and we're finding this out, of differentiating brands from each other. And uh, many of our uh, clients want to be the first in their region to make these changes. And um, I think that that's a, an incredible uh, opportunity for these companies. So, uh, and, and lastly, I think it's, it's just, there's a real positive feeling out there with these companies and working in sustainability. And uh, I, I started this business, um, you know, 15 years ago. And now there's an understanding that it has to be done. And uh, so it's, 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 it's a good time for sustainability. And I think it's, it's moving forward in a great pace. Good, thank you. And I, I wonder, where do, where do we pick up from next? You know, I'm, I'm pretty interested in the learning piece. I, I would love to hear from Nikhil and Gustavo sure. about, about learning. And, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm happy to take on, follow on from, from, from or, what you just yeah, said. Yeah, please, go, go for I it. Think, I, think, I think what we're seeing, I think one of the challenges in the industry for the last many years has been the number of different standards out there. Uh, and, you know, we're talking about, you know, getting to the consumer and educating them and creating awareness, you know, the creating them. But one of the challenge has been has been the different of the, every every customer of ours has had different different standards. Right. Or different or work with different parties. And I think if we're going to be more sustainable, we need to have a unified approach. And one actually one example that has worked in, in the last couple of years, which I've been involved in, is on the social side, actually, uh, called the Social and Labor Convergence Project, where we actually brought in brands who, you know, together with re with manufacturers and, and other stakeholders to actually come up with single assessments for social um, social means in, in factories. Um, and that actually helped us to then actually have a more positive impact on the supply chain. And we're beginning to see a lot of this collaboration. So linking to what you were saying about collaboration, we're being, beginning to see this, this multi-stakeholder. Before there was the, the buyer and there was a customer and there was a big divide. Now we're collaborating a lot more closer together. I'm even collaborating with my own competitors sometimes. Um, I'm, I'm involved, mentioned about circularity, working very closely with the Ellen MacArthur Foundation on a project, Make Genes you know, Circular, working together with different stakeholders to actually create circular genes by 2022. We're all working together. Uh, and I don't think there's going to be, you know, eventually, I think people want to be the first past the post, but I don't think there's going to be a competitive advantage going forward. I think the only way we can scale this up is by working together. I mean, if we're going to adopt the SDGs by 2030, we all have to work together. And this is what sustainability has to be seen, seen as. And I think it'll help with the government's aspect is if we can actually come up with similar assessments that they can actually adhere to. Because at the moment, there's just so many different, we're getting there, but there's still a lot of work that needs to be done on the different standards and assessments out there. Well, Amy, Amy, Amy. That's fantastic. Uh, Amy. Well, I, you know, first of all, I'm hats off to you for all of the work that you're doing. Um, you know, we were, you were talking about now it's really about collaboration. And I, I also really think that's true. Um, we're going to, we're going to die with competition if we're not careful. And, um, and I think I see things as, as joining networks, you know, how can we collaboratively share information? Um, and the cooperation kind of model and being able to strengthen yourself uh, in, in times of trouble 
uh, such as COVID, I think is really, really important. Um, and through that, we need to have more open data systems. So I just, I think that that's part of the, of the evolution that we're seeing uh, in there. So thank you. Yeah. Yeah, I would love to add something on that respect and also on the question of uh, education. Please. I think that's, that's uh, probably one of the areas, the biggest areas of opportunity that uh, is there uh, to join uh, public and private enterprise at, uh, collaboration and change the way we do today. There is too much fear to change educational programs and there is so much a need, a different need for education, talent development out there that, that we are not matching it well. So I think that's one area where really, really we take it seriously uh, and the uh, governments and industry together can create really a pipeline of talent for the future because the talent of the future will change. It is changing and it's changing faster than what we think. Uh, so some of the uh, um, a little speed to get to the level of performance that is required for the challenges that we see and that we saw in COVID and that we will continue seeing um, requires some talent that we don't have available totally. So uh, very important that the needs of, uh, of that talent are really well articulated and jointly programs to develop that talent is, are, 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 are are put together. Uh, I think that's very important. In the area of cooperation, uh, uh, you know, uh, even I really think you don't need to get into the secrecy of the business. You don't need to get into the IPs. You don't need to get into formulas. And when you do certain things, uh, if you move into a data sharing uh, that is. Um, interpreted by algorithms that are not identifiable by brand or formula or secrecy. Uh, um, because data can give us a, a currency and a, and a, and a, and a, and a common language uh, because uh, mostly the problems we face are similar. Uh, the products we're producing are not that different. But they are at, at the same time. And so how do we learn to take on interpretation of data to learn and accelerate progress is it will be a, a fantastic question to to to, to strive answering together again uh, 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 there are today uh, in the past we, we we could talk these beautiful things but uh, we really didn't know how to do it and today there are there are ways to know how to do it there are solutions to these type of problems there are there are platforms of knowledge there are there are there are big correlations uh, going on. There are a lot of uh, algorithmic analysis that can, that can be done that will really help us elevate the game on the operations and uh, strive for better sustainability, resilience, and all of that that we've been talking today and, uh, and drive to a different impact for uh, industry in general that will really, really help countries to prosper in a different way. Of course, framed into the business model that uh, every company has, or every enterprise will have, every supply chain network. I'm using the word network because it's, again, the ecosystem is, is inspired and based on the ecosystem. Uh, those, those supply networks uh, should uh, be able to leverage that and contribute to growth. Good. I love this. This is great. I'm, I'm curious, just we, we've got about, uh, you know, we've got about five, six minutes left. What has popped out of this call? Anything? Did, have you heard anything new, or anything that it sort of in, inspired you in the in the little crosstalk that we've had? I'm just curious if any of you have reflections uh, about you know a little new insight or anything you want to ask the other uh, other members of this panel. Yeah, I I, I do. I, I I think one of the subjects that came up is about education and about standardization, and I think those two go together. And one of the reasons that we have this issue is because waste streams traditionally aren't federalized. They're, they're localized. And so, especially in the United States, not so much in Europe. But it's no one understands what waste really is. And, um, you know, they, they think that when they get rid of their clothing, it just goes to Goodwill or to some other secondhand place. Well, that's not where most clothing goes. 
And I, I think um, we're all right in this, is that we've got to educate not only the clients that we have, and we spend a lot of time educating our clients, but also the consumer out there. And I think that's the key to start addressing um, the overall issue with, with waste and efficiencies. Cool. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, that's beautiful. Maybe. <laughs> Um, yeah, so two topics, uh, the education and standardization. Education from an adult standpoint and from a business standpoint, we did a, I worked on a media series uh, where I shot 220 interviews around clean tech and impact. And I literally would meet one person in the room and then they'd be talking about some need. And then I'd have the next person in the room who's like, oh yeah, we're doing this. And it was just like, you got to meet, you got to listen to each other. Um, so I think the education is not just on the next generation, it's really on the current uh, paradigm and helping people understand and dispelling the myth that being sustainable actually costs more because companies are making a tremendous amount of money retooling their, their systems and they're becoming more resilient and more able to weather these storms. Um, the standardization, I disagree with you uh, because I think one of the things that we're facing and the pain points that we're having around data is the need for diversity of information. Chemicals are very different than forestry and it's very different than, you know, some of the other inputs that are required. And you have diversity of thought. You have different, uh, you know, systems of government, different measurement systems. Um, so I, I really am pretty gung ho about uh, the collaborative model and uh, you know joining networks, but also allowing diversity to exist. So I think it's just it's problematic to think we're going to standardize everything. It's just it's it's fallacy. So sorry. Yeah. Nick Hill Nick Hill wants to come in, and I bet. Yeah, well, I'm, look, I think I, I think I think as long as there's no duplication from the point of view of a manufacturer, as long as I don't have to duplicate, um, you know, different audits and various things. I think that's very important. And I think from the point of view of think what needs to happen, we talked about, but we talked about the younger generation actually wanting to buy sustainable. They're going to actually, they're putting pressure on the brands now to actually be more sustainable. And I think where we need to actually need to get support now is actually how do we make the supply chain more sustainable? Because there are few, few of us who are out there who are, you know, sustainably driven. It costs money. Sustainability does cost money. I'd be wrong to say that we haven't invested a lot of money in sustainability. Have we seen the return yet? No, but it was the right thing to do. We probably, we hope we'll see the return. But there are many factories out there that have not gone down that sustainability journey, and they, they need they, you know we need to we need to help them to be to, to become more sustainable if the demand is going to be for that to be. So I think that's where the support is needed. Cool. But, uh, this, uh, all the points are so good that uh, I don't know if I can really really add something. Okay, at, uh, but I, uh, I I probably will say something about the standardization because I I don't think when we talk standardization. Uh, really, uh, in, 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 and I and I vote for it. By the way, and I I don't I don't think we are talking to the stream that we lose authenticity or, and, and and uniqueness of our business models or products. Uh, that, mm-hmm. that would be uh, stupid. Okay, that would be against against uh, uh, real brand competition. Uh, uh, but uh, but I think uh, I, I really get inspired by the idea of. Or moving towards a different way to educate uh, the industry, but also the consumer. I love that one because an educated consumer will have an ed- educated expectation, and it will force supply chains and manufacturers and everybody. The whole the whole chain will need to change, and we need to change in a way that we need to play together. Because uh, in an individual way, we will not be able to to make it happen. So. So that that to me is uh, is a great is is, is one lever that it, in this session we summarize it with something maybe we summarize it with that. Uh, the other one is that uh, I, I was I got really inspired with the the hangers uh, example uh, because it tells me something. It says if the solutions build the business, the solutions will be adopted better and faster. So there is a mission here not only to you know, let's not do this for the sake of, let's do this also enhancing the business so we accelerate it by itself, the progress. We can really we can really make it happen if we if the solutions are solutions that build the business. Good. So Ernst Jan, we we started with you and you got the floor. Any any reflections on anything you've heard or yeah, anything you want to add? 
Uh, I especially like your 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 last one-liner, uh, thinking from pollution perspective. I think that's a very good one to combine those worlds much more, the the impact side and the solution side, because then people start to see it when they see the, the benefit for them. And sometimes uh, it's a little bit too much ideology rather than practical solutions. So yeah, I think it's a good one. Great. Okay. Anything else? Last words for anyone? We're at about our time. Thanks to Frank for creating this awesome room. Yeah. Just same same here. Thank you, Frank and the Rasas team. And um, thank you for introducing me to all of you. It's been a pleasure working with you.